What's up guys, I'm Ari Rochelle and this is Nuggets of Truth. And as we said in previous videos, the Trinity is a core belief in Christianity, but like all things in life, some verses without fully understanding the context can seem contradictory and or confusing. And one of the most misunderstood verses is John 14, 28. And let's just read that real quick. It says, you heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the father for the father is greater than I. Now on surface level, this sounds like Jesus is completely excluding himself from the Trinity or at the very least deeming himself lower than the father in the Trinity, which makes sense if you just simply take this one verse alone at face value. And, you know, this isn't the only verse that seems to convey this idea. Here's another verse that is often taken out of context. John chapter 8, verse 28 through 29. It says, So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. On face value, again, this this seems like Jesus is saying that he he's he's nothing without the Father, and that he doesn't actually have his own authority. He doesn't really have anything. He's he's just a servant of the Father, which seems to be what he is saying, right? Here's another one, John chapter eight, verse fifty four. It says, "Jesus answered, If I glorify myself." My glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. And lastly, Matthew twenty four thirty five through 36 Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Now, someone, when explaining that these verses contradict the Trinity idea, said basically that if the Trinity was true, God would have taught it to us clearly. Now, to be honest, in essence, that sounds like a great statement. That sounds like that makes sense. That sounds very factual, especially if you quote verses like 1 Corinthians fourteen thirty three right after. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. But here's the thing. Each of these verses were taken out of context. Let's start with that last verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. This verse is speaking about, the, about church etiquette, how to handle speaking in tongues, prophesying, and even women's place in the church. It wasn't about verses being confusing. Otherwise, we would have to deem Paul greater than Jesus because Jesus spoke in parables specifically to confuse people. Mark chapter 4, verse 10 through 12. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven even paul would contradict himself by writing second corinthians three fourteen, which says but their minds were hardened for to this day when they read the old covenant that same veil remains unlifted because only through christ is it taken away as paul explained parables and complicated verses make up our bible because if we could understand with our own mind then we wouldn't actually need god we wouldn't need jesus we wouldn't need the holy spirit to explain these difficult verses to us so let's Let's just look at a few verses real quick just to make sure that the Trinity doctrine is actually biblical or actually has some type of weight to it. Okay, one of my favorite verses for the Trinity argument is John 1. To me that that's just solid proof. I I don't I don't need nothing past that. For me personally. We we even examined that and I, I think we examined it pretty thoroughly in our video what or who is the word of god which is under our nuggets of truth category though i know some people still were not satisfied with those verses which is fine 
another favorite of mine is John is Genesis chapter one verse one. It says, "In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth." Now, just reading this, it doesn't seem like much of an argument unless you go to the original Hebrew for the word God. Now, this is where it gets interesting because the Hebrew word for God is El, and this is why. God refers to himself as El Shaddai or El Elyon. He's making a distinction between himself and other gods. So when it says God created the heaven and the earth, one would think that it would be the Hebrew word for the singular God, right? El. That makes sense, but it's not. It's actually the Hebrew word Elohim, which is translated as gods several times. It is plural. We see this actually come out of God's own mouth in the creation of man. He doesn't say, "Let me go down and make man in my own image." He says, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness." Let's let's actually read that. Don't take my word for it. Let's read that verse. Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-six through twenty-seven. Then God said, "Let us." Make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. Notice how it goes from "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness," to God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. That plural is turned into a singular, which would explain why God was so adamant in the Old Testament and New Testament that God is one. In Deuteronomy six four, Matthew twelve twenty nine through thirty. In fact, James actually throws a little shade on the idea that understanding that God, plural God Elohim, is a, is singular. The idea of the Trinity, he he makes it like, good job, you know that. Who cares? That's baby stuff. James chapter two verse nineteen. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. James isn't the only biblical author who throws this kind of shade. The author of the book of Hebrews was explaining again the divinity of Christ in Hebrews five. The chapter ends with with the author writing in verses eleven through fourteen this about this we have have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing, for though. By this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So the idea of the Trinity not only holds weight. But according to James and the author of the book of Hebrews, it's the foundational belief for children in the faith. So, with that said, let's go back to these three verses that seem to point to Jesus excluding himself from the Trinity: John fourteen twenty eight, John eight twenty eight through twenty nine, and Matthew twenty four thirty five through thirty six. These verses are Jesus speaking as a man, not God. Just keep that in mind because the context of Jesus speaking is very important. So many people will be like, "Well, how is that even possible? Is he God or is he not God?" Well, I think Paul clears this up for us rather nicely in Philippians two verses five through eleven when he explains the hum the humility of Christ. He writes, "Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the in the form of God." Did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So according to Paul, who wasn't speaking on his own authority what was speaking according to the spirit of god because all scripture is god breathed this is important to understand that jesus while on earth acted as a man he lived as a man he felt pain sorrow temptation as a man he had to get up and pray to receive strength to make it through his days he didn't start doing miracles and performing signs and wonders until he was baptized and received the Spirit, until the Spirit came down and rested upon him. And why is this so important? Because if he overcame sin by being God, then we have no hope of overcoming sin because we will never be God. That's why Paul wrote that he understood that equality with God wasn't something that could be grasped. He understood that it wasn't something that we could take. We can never be God. We can never be equal with God. So he set that aside. And he became man. He became equal with man. This is why Jesus said in John 8, 28, I do nothing of my own accord. Because he had to learn. He didn't come down omniscient, om- omnipotent, and omnipresent. He was in his father's house learning from his father. When he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. This is why he says in John eighteen twenty eight that he has to return to the father because the father is greater than he. Because as Paul explains in great details in the verse that we just read, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Jesus has set aside his godliness to come down to earth and become a man. So Jesus, as a man, had to return to the Father in order to present himself as the sacrifice so that, so that the Father could accept his sacrifice and elevate him to his rightful place in order to forgive the sins of all who believe and repent so that he could then send the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus set aside his godliness and then had to receive it again. He had to accept it again after presenting himself as that perfect unstained sacrifice. Now, after his death and his resurrection, the way Jesus speaks actually changes. Take a look at this, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. It says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. If Jesus is just a man, if Jesus isn't a part of the Trinity, if Jesus is not God, he cannot call himself the first and the last. That would be blasphemy. That would mean he was corrupt. That would mean that he sinned. And Jesus is without sin. Revelation chapter 3 verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shut, who shuts and no one opens. Those are bold words for someone who isn't God, because if you say who shuts and no one opens and who opens and no one shuts, you would be including God in that no one. Very blasphemous words if you aren't, in fact, God. Revelation twenty two twelve through 13. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. These statements are much different than his prior ones. Why? Because Jesus, he died as a sacrificial lamb. But... When he rose, he rose as the lion of the tribe of Judah, filled with the authority he previously set aside. We see this in Revelation 5, 5 through 6. It says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. 
And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. See, Jesus only became the Lion of the tribe of Judah after conquering as the Lamb. Lastly, Matthew 24, 35 through 36. And we're going to read that one more time. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Now on the surface, it seems like Jesus is lowering himself to the father but we have to take into context why he said that each member of the trinity has a specific role as we just read in revelation only the lamb of god jesus could open the scroll god the father couldn't open the scroll no one was found let's read it again so that you you see what i'm talking about revelation 5 1 through 5 then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on, a, on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because... No one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Does this mean that Jesus is greater than the Father? No. They're equal members of the Trinity. They both make up one God because they each have their own roles in the Godhead. This actually isn't the only time that we see that Jesus does something that the Father can't do. Look at Acts chapter 4 verse 11 through 12 with me. This Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let's read that last verse one more time. And there is salvation in no one else. Again, and there is salvation in no one else. Now people would be like, well, maybe the Father has a name that we don't know because it says, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. True, sure. That's a good argument. Except there's, it's, says in the first part of the verse and there is salvation in no one else so the other name under heaven given among men would have to be talking about jesus and here's some proof for that revelation chapter 19 verse 11 through 13 then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Who else is the Word of God but Jesus John 1 verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word. He is the rider on the white horse. He is the Lamb of God. He is our salvation. It's by his name, only his name, that we can be saved. There is only salvation in him because he paid the debt he paid the price it's through his blood that we are saved that we are washed clean of our sins it's not through the father's blood it's not through the father's actions that we have been saved it's through jesus jesus made the sacrifice he came down 
The Father didn't come down and make the sacrifice. Does that mean Jesus is greater than the Father? No. It means that he had a different role to play than the Father. So just to sum everything up for you guys, God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So he speaks in parables so that we will have to seek him out to understand what he's saying. Jesus didn't say that the Father is greater because he was excluding himself from the Trinity, because he was excluding himself from the Godhead, but because he had emptied himself out and became man. So he was speaking as a man, not as God. He was speaking strictly as man so that when he overcame as a man, we also could overcome through him. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and that it answered any questions that you may have had about John 18, 28, or any other questions that you may have had about Jesus's role as God or if he even is God. I hope, hope we answered a few of those questions for you. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.